Hello everybody, my name is VG Pet, and we are here today to start Dwarf Fortress. This will not be the first episode of the Let's Play. Mind you, this is going to be a tutorial on how to get into the game. Alright. Now, Dwarf Fortress is a very complicated game. Now, I'm not saying that I was like, no, it's so... No, it's, it's complicated simply because it's not really advertised. And it has a learning curve that exceeds most other games that I, if you've ever played it you know what I'm talking about and when I do start playing it on here you will learn very quickly what I mean now saying that I'm going to show everybody how to get into the game where to get it from how to set everything up and maybe even give you a few tips on how to get things running better when you start out now then the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go onto the internet, haha, -ha, yeah, and you're going to want to type in the lazy new pack. You're going to get it from here. All right. Now you're going to go to Media Fire. You're going to download it. Do whatever you want. I've already done that, and you can see right here it's got some stuff that'll help you. Some utilities which are already installed. You know, just stuff to help you get through it. And there's also other tutorials and Let's Plays by other people that you can watch. Now then, I've already taken the liberty and done that. I've already got it. I already extracted it on my desktop. Now what you want to want to do, and you're probably going to want to make a shortcut for your desktop. Put that down there. Then we can just move that away. And then I'm going to remove shortcut. Because I hate shortcut. Alright. Now the first thing you're going to want to do when you start is turn on liquid depth. Why? Well, because it helps you see how deep water is. And, and that doesn't sound like much, but it is very important. Because it can tell the difference between knee-high water, ankle-high water, and water you'll drown in. Very important, and, well, you'll see when we get in-game. Second thing, if you're new to this and you do not know how to read ASCII, you're going to want to change the graphics. My suggestion is Iron Hand or Phobius. Mayday is very good too, but this comes down to a personal preference. So, we'll keep going on. And then you've got other things, which... Most of these are for... Most of these are things that I'm going to explain later. And then you have Advanced. And this is just to, you know, to set some pre... Pre, um, options. You know, sound. So I'm going to turn that down because it is very loud to start with. We're going to turn the intro movie on because I like the intro movie. Processor priority. Autosave. I do not turn autosave on. I I thought about putting it on seasonal, but not my... And then initial save is very good too. Compress save. All that. You shouldn't have to mess with. Windowed mode. Preference. FPS cap. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Now back to the main options. If you are very new to this game and you want to eliminate one of the biggest stumbling blocks, you're going to want to turn off aquifers. Now you might be saying, why? Well, an aquifer is a layer in the ground that contains an infinite amount of water. It's basically where people make wells. In real life, it's where, you know, you dig down and you have water and it, it is where it comes from. Now, if you're new to this game, this is going to be a big sticking point because it's going to be very, very, very hard to get around. Now, I'm not going to be turning it off because I want to show how to get around them and how to deal with them and maybe even how to turn them into something useful for your fort. But if you're new to the game, you don't really know a lot and you just want to get into the game and play and do well to start with, to be honest, you're going to want to turn those off. Now, like I said, I'm keeping mine on. Now then, the next part is after you get this, just, you know, play Dwarf Fortress. Minimize that. And you can resize this for this real quick. Do, do, do. Now, you want one from this, you know, you've got object testing arena. This is more for beta, like testing stuff you want to do in the game, not the specific game. Design, work new world with advanced parameters, no. Start playing, no. That's not going to be an option for you when you first start. So you're going to want to create a new world. So welcome to the Alpha of Dwarf Fortress. Very good. 
Now this is where we actually get into the game. This is where we're going to start generating our first world, where we're going to get the very basis of what's going to come for everything else. This is a very important step, and everything you choose here will affect you later in many, many ways. Now then, the first option you have here is world size. This is a preference, whether you want it to be a big world, small world, where you have to look through a lot, not do a lot. Everything's going to basically be the same. You're just going to have less options and less room to expand if you do keep the world for a long time. I suggest medium or large. So I'm going to go with large. Now, history. Now, this is a sticking point that it really depends on you. If it is very short, if it's very short, it's going to leave you off very close to the beginning of time for your world. And now this might be a, this is a, a good and a bad thing. A good thing is you won't have very many other advanced races to compete with because they don't exist yet. Everyone's like you. They're new. They're starting out. And yes, people are going to fight you, but they're not going to have as much technology or as many weapons and soldiers and Civil, just they won't be as big as they would if it was a very long history. Now, another thing is because it's very short, a lot of the very dangerous animals and creatures that would normally go extinct over the years over by hunting and just getting rid of because they're a danger to society and to each civilization are still going to be there. Titans, titans, um, mega beasts, just things that are very harmful to you and very powerful are still going to exist very early in history whereas if you choose a long history these are going to be much fewer although the ones that survive will be much stronger but less likely to ever appear also the civilization would be more advanced they'll come more prepared and while they might be more friendly if you ever do get into problems with them they're going to have more spears to shove up your ass which eh, depends on what you want to do. Now, medium kind of gives a good balance. It's going to have a few, a few civilizations who are doing okay and still have some very dangerous creatures. And it's kind of a sliding ball of what you want to do. I'm, I like medium. I, I, I kind of tend to short sometimes just because I like fighting those big motherfuckers. I like that, but adds a preference. So we're going to go for this one. This world medium. Next, civilizations. How many different distinct races and cultures? The more of these, the more actual... Now, the more actual... Like, you can have multiple cultures among one race. You can have different civilizations for the dwarves, or the goblins, or whatever else may come along. Like, there could be, like, 20 different dwarven cities if you choose a large world and a long enough history, or 20 different of this, or 20 different of that. It just depends. So the more of them, the more different ones they'll be, and the more chances you can have to trade with them or fight them. There's no real downside or upside to choosing a lot or a little. It's, again, preference. Number of sites, number of important places, caves... Fortresses, abandoned ruins, towns, stuff like that. Beasts. This is another one. Like I said earlier, titans, mega beasts. Stuff that are dangerous. The big ones, the big ones. This is where you're going to choose that option. Now this also includes stuff that are not, maybe not as big as titans or anything like that, but more dangerous animals too would also appear in this. So we're also going to keep that at medium. For me, for you, you can choose anything you want. It just depends on whether you want to make it easier or harder at that point. Natural savagery. In the world, there can be either it can go either it can go one of three ways. It can go it can go technically nine ways, but it's it's kind of a sliding. It slides around. Now you're going to need to have areas that are neutral. Just you know, oh, you got badgers and squirrels and horses and badgers and marmosets and badgers and squirrels, and badgers, and neutral areas. And then you have the more areas that are not quite as friendly. They're going to have undead things, which is awful, actually. Undead, pl undead places can be terrible places to go, 
but great places if you like the challenge. Stuff like, you know, undead badgers, which you can't kill as easy as just regular badgers. Or even undead bears, who can just maul your face off and all your, you know, stabby weapons are useless because it has no organs. And then you also have on the flip side, you have more genile areas, gentle areas. Stuff with unicorns and fairies. Fairies can be very annoying, but they'll never be as dangerous as the undead. Unicorns, on the other hand, I've had I've had situations where unicorns have impaled up to two to three dwarves on its, you know, sharp little horn at the time, just because I pissed it off. Now, that's my fault, and they're very dangerous, but they're not as directly evil as the undead and uh, undead and evil areas. So it's 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 a sliding thing. Now, obviously, you're also going to have flip side. You can have more chaotic areas that are good, where you have more unicorns and more pissed off unicorns. And if it's in a in an area with water, you can have in an evil area. You can have undead carp who will come onto land and start trying to suck your dwarves' brains out. Again, I keep this in medium just because I like having both. Very low makes things basically more unicorns and then very high more stuff that's gonna try and suck your brain out mineral currents this is for you to choose how much gold and iron and candy you want to have in the ground very low will make it harder to get get caught stuff like copper and steel later on but the ones you do find will be more it'll it'll feel better when you find it it's kind of, it's a challenge thing and when they're more common the thing is when they're more common there's also a higher chance that they're more useless too something like zinc which you can't really use for weapons and armor is really only good for just having around and making statues and furniture and whatever else your nobles that you ever get might want important yes I'd like to put mine at either sparse or frequent. For this let's play, I'm going to use frequent. And then you're going to hit go. Now, we're just going to skip ahead of this because I've already done this. God damn it, that thing is annoying. I think I've already closed it though, so we'll just go back. I've already done this, but you're going to have to let that run all the way through. And it's going to show you how many people have, been, have lived, have come, and have gone through your world over time. So here we go. We're going to start playing and I've already made one. It's called Amethythulu. Who cares, right? I don't. Dwarf Fortress. Now, here's the thing about Dwarf Fortress. Sometimes it'll take a while to load things. Why? Well, it's loading a lot in the background. Now, let me show you just quite real quick how big this world is, because I did choose large. So we're going to open this with Photo Viewer right real quick. It's a big world. I cho I always like to choose large because I like that extra bit of just a lot of places to go. And there's a lot. Each one of these squares is about 50 by 50, and inside of those is even more. I think it's 15 by 15, so it, it is expand out and flesh out a lot. These gray areas are mountains, and then you got the blue, the rivers, and you have these areas right here, the purple ones, that are evil, or savage, or whatever you want to call them, terrifying. Then you have volcanoes, sometimes out in the ocean, sometimes on land. These red areas here are sand deserts. Red, there's a red sand desert, and just a regular one, and these gray and brown areas right here are rocky wastelands. Not going to have much vegetation, not going to have much, many trees, but won't have many enemies wanting to go at you either, because you don't have much. And then the green is just varying, varying areas of forest or jungle, just depending on where you want to go. Now down here, you have glaciers. And yes, evil glaciers are possible, and then around them you have stuff like the tundra, and just stuff like that. Now these areas here that look like wells or towers, cut off towers, are towns or fortresses for other civilizations. Now these come in varying effects, like these ones are more minor, 
well, I'm not quite sure if I'll be able to find one quickly. There are some that are much bigger, like this one here, this gold. Uh, gold right there is a, is one of the largest for that civilization, whether it's dwarven, goblin, whatever else it might be. It's very big, and it's very dangerous. Now, now we're back at this. Now we got the world map, and you can kind of tell it's the same world. You have the world map, and then you have the region, which is, just shows you the same size as the map we just looked at, about where we are. See, there's the evil area I pointed out. It's haunted. Everybody loves haunted shit, doesn't, don't they? I know, right? And as you can see, I did keep aquifers on. And over here just gives us a bit, even a more zoomed in area. As I said, each of these squares has more in it, and then more inside those as well. So, what we're going to do is, I'm going to pick an area out that has a lot in it. I'm going to explain what each of these mean, which is important because it can help help you decide a good place from a bad place from a place that you'd never want to go to ever again. Now, we'll just choose this one at random. I, I just kind of scrolled over, so I wasn't even looking for any specific one. This is a temperate freshwater marsh. It's got a warm temperature, it, the trees are woodland, moderate vegetation, and calm surroundings. Temperature, de temperature defines how quickly water evaporates. If it's really cold, water freezes instantly. It can, be, it can get to the point where water freezes instantly when it's out, and when it rains, if something fills up, it freezes like that. And if it's very warm or it gets too hot when you get too far north or too far to the equator, because we're in the southern hemisphere in this world, world, map, whatever. When we're in the southern, gets more north, near the equator, water will evaporate instantly. You won't have any rivers. And now this also depends on the season. When it's summer, in the colder areas, water might thaw out very shortly, but it will also freeze up very quickly when it starts to get colder. Even in spring, it might freeze up. It's hard to say. It depends on where you are. Now trees, woodland, woodland basically defines that it has a lot of trees. Not as many trees as a jungled area, but it still has a lot, which is a good thing. Vegetation, moderate. Stuff like strawberries and edible leaves, tubers, stuff like that that you can find and forage for yourself when you're starting out. Now vegetation also defines how many wild animals you might find. If there's not much vegetation, wild animals like badgers and squirrels and lions and even even more than that wouldn't want to come there because there's not much there that's why when I said earlier rocky wastelands and sand deserts sand deserts deserts wouldn't have much vegetation therefore many animals wouldn't be there life would be hard because you wouldn't have many opportunities to get food either through edible leaves and tubers or meat from animals which could which would make life hard. Now it's got a stream going through. It's a named stream, so it's a it's a fairly large one. And on this in this area that I've got selected on the side, which you can see that I'm moving now, is that's the area that it's showing at this point. In this area it has shallow clay, clay which you can use to make pots, pottery. Very deep soil, which is more soil going down, an aquifer, deep metal, and flux stone. Aquifer, like I said before, is an area below the dirt, and sometimes even below rock, that contains a lot of water, an infinite amount even, that can flow in from the sides when you dig down into it, which makes digging down and life very difficult. It also has deep metal, which means metal, now this is going to sound stupid, but it has metal deep in the earth. This means there's no metal up closer to it either. So, if you ever want metal, you're just going to have to dig through the soil, then the aquifer, and then you'll hit deep metal, the deep metal. Now, this is still going to always be the same, like copper, iron, tin, zinc, but it only has one type of metal here. It doesn't specify deep metals with an S, just metal. So, there's only going to be one type. Now, this is a gamble because it could be anything. It could be anything spectacular like iron or copper or whatever you want but it could also be something very shitty like zinc 
or or tin. Tin, fuck tin. And it's got flux stone. A flux stone is something like chalk or marble that is used in the reaction for creating steel as a carbon product. Something to release carbon to make the steel. Now this is something that requires more knowledge into the game or even into metalworking than most people would have at this point so they wouldn't know. But when you're u taking iron to steel you have to have something releasing carbon in the, pro in the reaction for it to become steel because steel is a carbon based metal. And a flux stone is what provides that. Flux stones are worth quite a lot. They cannot be used directly as a metal, but they do create more valuable stuff. Like, if you make a marble table, it's going to have more worth than just a rock table. Simply because it, it's marble. It's a really nice material. And it's flux, so it's good. Now, you're going to also have areas that let's just go somewhere much different. Not in the ocean. We're going to go here. See, now this is a completely different area. This is a tropical, dry, broadleaf forest. See, it's heavily forested, lots of vegetation, but because of that, it has a lot of animals, and a lot of untamed animals, so it's an untamed wild, and it's very warm here. It has flux stone, it has a little soil, not a lot of clay, but it has a lot of deep metals with an S, so it's going to have many down below, but it doesn't have an aquifer here. Now, this could be a com this could be a wonderful place to go because digging down you won't have any anything to impede you going down so you could just dig straight down and getting to the deep metals wouldn't be as hard as in the other area that had the aquifer now if we move over, now as we move over see the aquifers back aquifers are very common mind you i'm trying to find an area see there's an area with shallow metal this could this could either be in line with the aquifer or above the aquifer it just depends and it also has very deep soil, so the aquifer is probably in the soil, and it's not fun. Another area with untamed wilds. Most areas are either, at this point in history, are either going to be calm or untamed. Obviously, so you also have areas that are like the mountains, which have lots of metals and flux stone. And surprisingly, this area has a lot of vegetation, but it has no trees, it's very warm, and it's got a lot of wild animals. Why it has vegetation here? I haven't the faintest fucking clue. That's uncommon. So you could see now even this area of the mountain has an aquifer. Uncommon, but still possible. Everything's possible, and at least in one point or another, within reason. Now one last thing I'm going to show you about. Well, I've got a few more things, but one last important thing is we've got this area here. Now we have your neighbors. You have neighbors. You're not just going to be your dwarves and that's all there's going to be. No, there's more than that. There's a lot more than that. You have your dwarves, so you have other dwarven neighbors, and you have humans, and you also have goblins and elves. Goblins are almost always hostile. Now they can sometimes not be, but that's rare, and that's rare for it to stay. <laughs> humans are almost always they're not, they may not be allied with you, but they're not against you. Not directly, anyway. Elves, it depends. Now, as the world gen, your dwarven civilization might find themselves, without your consent, doing stuff to piss off one group or another. So, humans could already be at war with us because of stuff that had happened earlier in history that we had no control over. Now this is also your civilization, so we chose a medium, so we have many different dwarven ones to choose from. And as you can see on the world map, you have the two blue dwarven statues that are moving as I change to the civilization to show where our home civilization is located at. The closer we are to it, the more likely we are to get migrants and trade caravans, while the farther away from it, it's less likely to be. Now, before we were with the Heroic Sacks. That's a terrible name for civilization, and I'd, I wish one day to change it, but that's what it defaulted to. Now, we can change it, actually, and be with the trustworthy Blahs. Now, our neighbors might still be the same with them, but it could be different, actually. 
not all dwarves have the same neighbor or not the same neighbors even but the same alliances and wars with now obviously if you go out onto an island your neighbors are going to be very limited and if you change civilizations you might be at war or allied with or even neutral with different groups now obviously our neighbors can expand into other races if you so are inclined to add them but for now I do not have any for now I plan on adding some later but not for now the last two things on this menu are elevation you know, if you know how to read a contour map this will not be new to you it just shows hills, cliffs obviously the closer we get to the mountains the more steep it starts getting to the point where it would just be impossible to go here because look at that that's literally like just spikes at that point that wouldn't be a fun place to be or land and this area here it's mostly flat with a little bit of hills on the bottom corner but nothing too infirm now this will not be my final area but it's just since this is the tutorial video and it's just for explanation let's find a let's find real quick a nice area with oh I like I thought I saw an area with no aquifer hmm now obviously you can search with the F key but I don't want to do that because that takes a bit of time hold on oh. oh wait a minute here we go it's clay some soil deep metals flux stone it's a bit warm lots of forest thick vegetation untamed wild and it's got a stream down there so it is gonna have some water I'm gonna make that a bit bigger so we do have some mountain area in it same neighbors as before we will have a closer dwarven it's, um, master race I guess and as you can see the, the corners of this area are very steep and it's very hilly but that's not the point so we're going to hit E for embark I've selected a larger area than normal just to show you know now on by default these are some pre-generated items you can have for your dwarves stuff like you can have it comes default with two miners a, wo a woodcutter mason craft and all that but we'll, I'm going to show you how to pre pre prepare carefully now Here's your mind. Here are all your dwarves. They all start out as peasants, but this can be changed by you. As you can see in the bottom corner, you have a set amount of points that you can allot to your dwarves to get better at and to get items, which I'll show you how to do in a second. Now, for the first dwarf, what you're going to want to do is you're going to just want to look through everything. You got miners, woodcutters, carpenters, and then you have all sorts of um, craftsmen, um, herbalists, cooks other worker you've got a lot of stuff that you can make your dwarves all the way down to stuff like doctors and liars and leaders and even a teacher now but for your first few dwarves what you're probably going to want to start doing is have at least two dedicated miners now why because mining is what you're going to be doing a lot because you need you need ores you need rock and you need someone to help get you an area carved out to live in so these are very important and they will always be important and the more points you allot, allot in this the better they are in it but the more points it costs which takes out a fair bit 5 point, 6 point, all the way up to 10 so we're going to make them both proficient now for the third one what you're probably going to want to do is what you need to think about is what do I need to survive? Well, we need wood. So we're going to have a woodcutter. Now, because he's not always going to be out there with his axe, you're also going to probably want to make him a carpenter. So that when he does come in, or when he does bring the wood in, he can start making beds and chairs and tables. Now, obviously, you're, going to, you're not going to need as much wood as you are rock, and this becomes less important than later, so you only really need one. Now, with the miners, I only gave them one profession because they're going to be doing that a lot and they're not going to stop doing that probably for as long as they live 
which might watch might be very long or might be very short depending on how dangerous you like to play but for the woodcutter because he's not going to always be out there not always be chopping we also give him a second profession to fill up his day dwarves don't mind free time but if they have too much free time they're going to get pissed off now for the fourth one you gotta think okay i've got rock i've got wood what else do i need hmm, i need food food is good well, no, before we get to food, let's think. We've got rock, we've got wood, but we don't have anyone to work with the rock. So we're going to have a mason. A mason is going to be working almost as much as your miners. You're always going to need doors, and doors and tables, and even starting out weapons that can be made out of rock. Before you get really into ore and start being able to craft a lot, you're going to need someone to make you some just stuff to live with until you get along. So you're going to need to have a mason. Now obviously an engraver and a building designer are necessary for other things and because a mason while working a lot might not always be working putting a few points into these just so you can have someone that if later need be have them you have one here to start out with. Now for the fourth one like I said before we need food we need someone who can help get us food. Maybe not even just help get us food, but to help grow it or, you know, a grower, a farmer. Putting a lot of points into this early on is not a bad thing at all. You might also want to make them a herbalist because if you run out of seeds or you don't have enough room or time to farm, he can go out and forage for food more directly just from like wild strawberries and whatever else he might find. Now because of this, because he might not always be working, and because, to be fair, farming takes a while and you're going to have free time, putting these at max might not be the best idea. You might also want to give him a third profession because he's not always going to be able to do these things because stuff doesn't grow that fast. But brewing alcohol, which dwarves love and dwarves cannot live without, is necessary. Having that as a third profession for him would be a very good idea. Necessary? It's necessary to have a brewer. You need alcohol. If you don't have alcohol, your dwarves are basically going to shoot themselves because with the world they live in and the shit you're going to have them to do, unless they're drunk, they're not going to want to live very long. And two, they need it. You really cannot not have alcohol. Now, for the last two, these are more up to you. For me, for my last two dwarves, peasants, I like to have one who's just going to be around to move stuff, to move rock, to help just do stuff, but I also want him to have the secondary profession not as, he's basically just there as a commoner to help do stuff, but also to have a secondary profession to do should the need arise. And for one of them, I'd like to have them be a doctor, to be able to dress wounds or diagnose if they're sick or do minor surgery if necessary minor surgery and I don't put a lot of points into these just the first level to make them a novice at it because to be honest if it becomes necessary for them to work a lot I'll make them a doctor later on and they'll get a lot of points into this very quickly doctoring skills raise fast so it's not necessary to grow these early on with your points that are very limited we went from 200 something down to 32 very quickly so having these at low levels early on isn't a bad idea it's just having them is almost necessary now for the last dwarf that you're going to have it depends it depends on what you want and depends on what area you're in if I was in a very dangerous area which I'm in a semi dangerous area you might want to go down and look for axemen, swordsmen, macemen, make them a fighter, a military man, someone who can help fight and just keep shit off you. Now you also might want, if you're in a less dangerous area, well mine's not directly dangerous, it has more animals, so I might not need someone as up front as a spearman. I could get, I could have a hunter someone who 
can hunt things. Now, th this has varying degrees of success because to be honest, your military can be just as effective hunters, but you have to tell them a little bit more directly what to do. Although this is, this can also be more of a convenient bonus because you cannot exactly tell a hunter to stop until you completely remove their profession, which I'll show you how to do later, but not quite right now. So, having some to get to actually get them to be a hunter, they have to have the ranger the ambusher and it's mostly the ambusher to be honest the ambusher and trapper stuff like that for them to be hold on ambusher and a trapper just to be you know at least semi successful with it now for me I don't exactly see this as necessary for the area I'm in and for as the bonuses that I'm thinking about and for me planning on going to war with several people later on I'd actually probably be better off with the military starting out, but if you're wanting a more peaceful approach and just having someone out there who can help collect animals, rabbits, squirrels, badgers, badgers, and badgers, you'd be better off with a hunter starting out, mainly just because it doesn't quite take as many points or as much effort on your part to have them go out and do it. But for me, I don't mind a little bit of micromanaging to make it work with less points starting out. Now, while the hunter would do very well more long-term in the forward, the military is more for military, even in the long term. So it doesn't, it, it's really just a personal preference on how peaceful you plan to start out playing and how long-term you want them to be. So for me, I'm just probably going to put an axeman out there. Maybe not mm, adequate. Now, we've gone through all our dwarves. We've gone through all of them. They all have jobs. We've got miners, woodcutters, masons, farmers, brewers, a doctor, and someone to chop shit up should the need arise. Now, we're going to hit tab and go over to our items. These are our items that we're starting out with. We've got two copper pickaxes, two copper battle axes, an iron anvil, which is good. We need an anvil. We also have beer, rum, ale, and spawns and seeds. Spawns, seeds, and nuts are basically what your farmer are going to use to start growing. Plum helmets are very good. Plum helmets are probably what you're going to grow most. Pigtails, good. Cave wheat, that's what you're going to use to make bread. Not necessarily as good for brewing, but as good for food. And then sweet pods and rock nuts are also for brewing, but they're also good for food as well. While plump helmets, they're good for food, but they're much better for alcohol. And then you have stuff like alpaca kidneys. This is just random stuff that it gives you based on your home, where your home is at. And I think ours is more north, so they have alpacas. Just to kill. <clears throat> and then lungfish, also from the home. And then thread, cloth, bags, ropes. Vulture leather quivers. I didn't know le vultures had leather. And then buckets, splints, and crutches. Now, depending on how you want to play... You can maybe add, remove, depending on how many points you get, some of these. And if you're feeling ballsy and you don't plan on growing your ore industry very quickly, you can actually remove the anvil for a fair sum of points so you can get other things. And then you can later on either trade for or steal an anvil from the trade caravans or from another civilization. Now, if you plan on being a complete dick, my suggestion is to remove the anvil because once that first elven or goblin or whoever or even human caravan comes comes around and decides hey we have an anvil would you like to trade you can rub your little hands together as evilly as you want and be like oh yes come on in let's see that anvil and then slit their throat and take it for yourself now this is gonna piss them off and you're gonna have a war but you had an anvil and an easier starting out know, without having to worry about where you're going to get it now one last thing on this screen that is very important before I start getting a little bit more into the numbers is on the side you also have animals. Now I'm pretty sure you can figure out quite real quickly the benefits of having bulls and calves and cows, meat and milk, stuff like that, then ducks and ducklings for eggs and for feathers and whatnot. Now you're also going to have stuff like puppies and dogs and even cats. 
and the horses and lambs and I, I'm pretty sure you can figure out the benefit of having pigs. Mmm, pigs. And then cabbies, which are small animals. Don't, don't worry too much about them. Unless you really want them and you like cabbies, in which case, go for it. And you've got guinea hens. Mostly, most of these are birds and small animals, but you also have stuff like alpacas, which you can, you can shave alpacas for their quote-unquote fur. And then your bunnies and buck rabbits and all that. Now, for me, what I would highly suggest you do when you're starting out is to get war dogs or at least hunting dogs war dogs war dogs and hunting dogs are cost the same so you're better off with the war dogs why because they start they're a good starting military item and they also will breed to create younger dogs which you can breed to do whatever you want but dogs are necessary just so you can have someone to help you fight early on so I have a male and a female war dog now something else is you're also going to want to get a cat at least one male and one female. Two, if you feel like you're in a starting area, they might kill them early on. But you really only need one of each. Because cats make dwarves happy. Cats adopt dwarves and help them alleviate all that stress that they build up. Mining, digging, and working. Just so they, they don't kill themselves from the stress. So having cats is good just so that your dwarves won't feel so stressed out during the day. Now this is a good thing and a bad thing is while it might help them alleviate stress if their cat dies of anything other than natural causes your dwarves aren't going to be happy. And I've had some stories before where I've had dwarves literally go berserk to the point that they become demon spawn in memory of their kittens. Kittens, not full grown cats, just kittens. Now that's rarer, and honestly, you have to have a dwarf who's pretty broken in the head to start with for that to happen. But it can happen. And trust me, it's it's funny as hell, but it can bring down a fort. Which sounds stupid, I know. But it has happened to me before where a cat has died to someone very important, and it's just caused a spiral where he shit on people's heads not literally, figuratively, made their lives miserable because his cat died and other people got pissed off and they call, had a riot because he was being a dick then he died, then his wife got pissed off and so his wife was like well, you blah, 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 and he killed someone and she killed someone's daughter and it just started spreading out from there and we had a little miniature it, it got crazy it, and it will get crazy now this is is a it's a it's a fun thing to have happen. Now, if you have a really long term for it, and you don't like it to happen, it could be bad. But it's going to be something you need anyway. So don't go without cats, even if bad shit can happen, which it will. Now, back to the items. I'm going to get into the numbers a little bit for this. For stuff like crutches, splints, and buckets, we have a carpenter, and these are actually these cost actually ten points each. And having three sets of crutches might be a bit much for a starting fort. And if you don't think you need all those, which I don't think I would, I'd remove... I just have one set of crutches. I don't think I'm going to get into that much trouble so early on that I'd need that many. Splints, same. Buckets, I'll take two. Now, quivers, I don't think I'm going to have much need for a lot of quivers early on because I don't think I'm going to do much archery. So I don't need three quivers, so I'll put just one. Now rope is important because, well one, it's good for a doctor to have in case you have anything go wrong, but it's also good in terms of, just in general, to have bags, cloth, thread, bags and cloth are for holding things like your seeds and other things, and you have your plump helmets and all that. Now I don't think I'm going to need much rope. I'll take out a couple things of bags, and there we go, I've got 195 points from when I almost had none before. Just from getting rid of some of the excess that I had. Now for me, what I like to do is I like to get a little bit more ale starting out, because the brewing industry for me, or not just ale, but also seeds as well, so that I can start getting a lot of food quickly, just so I can stockpile it and not have to worry too much about it. Now, if you don't want just specifically these, you can hit in for new, 
and you can go through the meat, fish, eggs, drinks, digging implements, weapons, training weapons, ammo, anvils, leather, cloth, silk, cloth, yarn, wood, stone, metal bars, small cut gems, large cut gems, sand, glass, clay, stone blocks, trap components, bodywear, handwear, headwear, footgear, legwear, shields, cheese, powders, extract crafts, toys, instruments, tools, cages, barrels, buckets, flasks and water skins, quivers, backpacks, bags of all sorts and sizes, threads of all sorts and sizes, ropes of all sorts and sizes, splints, crutches, and then miscellaneous like lye, charcoal, potash, pearl ash, and coke. And add any of these that you want. If you want more variety in food, you can start picking up stuff like mountain goat tribe, or chopped mountain goat liver, or even or even the almighty prepared yak eye. Or if you want fish for a little bit of more of a shell food or seafood variety, you can get stuff like lungfish and cave lobster and all that and then eggs. And then you can figure out from here what you want. It even shows you how much each one cost in points. Whether this is necessary for your starting forward or not is besides the point. It's more for you to choose what you want. Now the difference between a buzzard ending and a blue jay egg really isn't much. Now some dwarves will have a preference, but in general, having to choose between the two won't really matter. Now, drinks though on the other hand, is something I do actually say you get all you can. Dwarves like variety. Drinking the same kind of ale over and over will piss your dwarves off. Seriously, I'm, I'm serious. If all you have is beer and that's all they drink for one, two, three months of your in game, they'll start to hate you. So having wine and beer and ale and rum is helpful. Now I'm gonna put a put this up to thirty of each, not necessary, but something I like to do. And then add some of the wine. Now it comes at the bottom of the list, so it's not all together. So I got thirty of each good for starting out and I can ex expand this when my brewing industry gets up which I'm also going to help implement earlier on by increasing the amount of seeds I start out with so I can make bigger farms now seeds are very inexpensive because it takes work stuff that is already made that you can add like if you go down to this and you go to weapons or yeah weapons so you got copper mazes these all cost 30 50 points each that's a lot. That's actually quite a lot. And you've got bolts, too, for crossbows that one bolt can cost 30 points. That costs a lot because they're already made. Stuff that is in these menus that haven't been made into anything and are just raw materials like wood don't cost much to bring to start. That's why the thing like an anvil, which takes a lot of work, iron, or a lot of work and ore to make, cost it a lot and we got a lot of points for now me, I think I'm going to be a bit more aggressive early on, so I didn't need it, so I brought it out. So, that just, that too is something you have to think about. Now because these seeds take a lot of work to actually do anything with, they don't cost much to buy to start out with. Now this is all stuff you're bringing, now I, I need to remind you that this is all stuff you're not going to get like over and over. This is just stuff you're being, that's being brought with you at the start. It's, it's going to be given to you at the start when your horses make landing wherever you're starting at on the map. So, I added more I added more plump helmet spawns than anything else because, like I said, they're good for brewing, they're good for eating, better for brewing than anything, but I needed that alcohol early on. And I'm probably going to grow more of those than anything anyway, so it's good to start out so I can build those farms early. Now, i still got 30 points, which... I might add food, I might add fish, might even add eggs, or hell, I might even, I might even not even add any items, but I might also add, hell, let's look for chickens. Why chickens? Well, because I like chickens, and you can make, you can have them slaughtered for meat, not a lot, mind you, not as much as you would get from a cow, but they're cheap, expensive, and they also lay eggs. And you have some dwarves who have a propensity to just love eggs. And because they're chickens, they'll lay a lot. Now, obviously, you could go for other things. You can be a bit more herdeder, and you can go for gooses, which cost the same. They're a bit bigger, but they're skinnier, and they don't provide as much meat. But they provide more eggs. More eggs in a cluster, anyway. 
So that's another thing you have to think about. Now all of these little little menial things that don't sound like why would I know gooses lay more eggs? Well, it's just something you have to play through and find out on your own. Like you wouldn't think you could shave a llama to get llama fur or llama hair to turn into llama blankets for your llama llama skin beds, but still you could. And then you probably wouldn't also think that you could take um, reindeer antlers and make knives out of them, but you can. This game has a, a stupid amount of a stupid amount of depth at times that it doesn't always like tell you about. So certain things you're like, oh, I think I'll do this, and the game's like, no, and you're like, why? Because of this, and you're like, but I didn't know that, and the game's like, I know, I know. I'm also gonna add a couple more dimple cups, and then put my last point to cave into rock nuts. Actually. Let me see real quick. Let me let me go back to chick chickens. How many of them did I get? I got two of each. So yeah, we will do that. I'm getting more because they die easy, like really easy. They don't have much hit points. Not like your dogs, which will be able to survive a blow or two. No, if you kick a dog, it's gonna just kind of be like, oh, it hurt. But if you kick a chicken, that's going to die. And starting out, animals have a tendency to fight each other just because they're not used to each other. So, mm hmm. So you can also name your group and be like, we are the where the cloisters are floating. Well, the banner of fogs, the sack of brittles. I like being sacks. So it will be the sacks. And at the top, you see Liba Shalash is our starting area. Now, for the sake of this tutorial video, I'm just going to show you how to start out real quick. Not anything too in depth, because that's what we'll get into in the actual Let's Play. This is just the video to start out with before we actually get into that. Now, this part is going to take a minute because it's figuring out all the stuff and blah 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 you have arrived after a journey from the mountain homes into the forbidding wilderness beyond your horse trick has finally ended your party of seven is to make an outpost for the glory of all of Immerstral. dwarven history begins here at this place libishalash axe leagues strike the earth we are at libalash let's get out of here you arrive in early winter I'm going to hit tab real quick to, to make this a little bit bigger. So see, isn't this just really easy to tell what's going on? I forgot to turn on liquid depth, so this right here, this blue, that's, that's water. We move up and down. Now this is a very, this is a top-down 2D game. So let me explain real quick just quite where, what everything is. So as you can see, these up and down arrows are basically ramps that go up and down that let you go from one Z level to the next. As you go up, you can see it's a fairly steep hill right there. And as you can see, the edges of it are rock, and that is, let's see what kind of rock, that's chert. No real use, but who cares. And right here we have our dwarves, this guy right there blinking, he's our woodcutter. There's a miner, some chickens, and then just some... There's some golden bamboo. That sounds tasty. And then you got trees, acacia. We we kind of went to a more jungly kind of more jungly area, obviously. So you have your water, and you can. And this right here, this this yellow is sand, and the black area is just stuff that you cannot see into. Like it's just in the earth. And then you go down. Let's zoom out a bit. We'll go up as high as we can. See, this is the top of the area, and then we go down, and it starts getting steeper and more areas that you can explore. And then right there in the middle is our dwarves, as we keep going down. And then there's a big plain right there that I'm sure many animals are in, but not quite sure. Just keep going down, and it just kind of heals downward. Not too steep, but still enough to make it to where having a big area wouldn't be too having a big ford you'd have to build downwards as well as up and over here is just a big open area space now this area has a lot of trees plants and rocks and the like so and right here we have a colony of bumblebees so if you ever wanted to get honey or you want if you started out with the beekeeping profession you could start right here and you could start on that and be something you could do to start with and then here's some that's a chert 
church seems to be the main stone of this area. Now this will change. Church's not going to be common everywhere. And right here, it's a Morian cluster. Morian is a great gem. And then over here we have Bandit A Gate. A Gate's Bandit A Gate's bread. And then here's more Morian. So Morian and A Gate seem to be a fairly common gem, at least in that area, in those church walls. See, there's more of it actually. And what the hell's this? What's this? The X, the yellow X is my cursor in game anyway, by the way. And then here, here's a white opal cluster. So here we have our little drawers, this little gray, this little brown area right here is our starting out area, it's our wagon. And we hit T, we can see what's it, T. Now these things on the side I'm going to explain later exactly what they do. I'm just sort of explaining the interface at this point now. With A, you can view announcements like there's nothing happened. B is for buildings, beds, armor, all that. C is for civilizations. The only one we know about the current is our own. D is for designations, mining, channeling, making stairs. This is mostly to start due with miner or miners or woodcutters or your um, herbalists. And then you have a lot of others like K just kind of lets you look at stuff very specifically, like. We go down a level. This is a murky pool. It's get filled up with water. This is grass. This game is very specific. This is grama grass. This is zoysia grass, carpet grass, and that's yellow sand. Cause apparently, something can move the grass from there. You have all sorts of other things that I will explain as the game goes on, and I do not have the time to explain all of this right now. And I've already explained quite a lot in this video, which is almost an hour long at this point, which is quite what it is. Now obviously, you're going to have a fair bit you can do from this point starting out. You can either start digging, you can start building out outside. Personally what I like to do is build inside, but that's what we'll do in the actual videos. For me, this is about where we're going to leave it off. There's a lot we could do from this point. This isn't quite where I want to make my world or make my fort, whatever. So we're not going to exactly stay here. This is just a good way to, just to show off how it goes. Now, by this point, you've already started the game, you've made what you want, and you're in the place. And in the next videos, I'm going to start explaining this is the day-to-day -day survivability. I don't be choosing an actual area. Now, I'll show you how to choose a much better area than what I did, because I just chose one at random. What you're going to want to do when you do it is let's abandon this fort, because I really don't care. I'll make one in, a different one in a minute for the next videos. So it's ending that... What you're mostly looking for is, depends on how much of a challenge you want. For me, I like to have deep and shallow metals with an S, so that I'm not confined to one thing. I've had one fort that I've had for a long time, that the only metal it's had access to was copper. And the main enemy I had was goblins, who didn't use anything above copper, so I had a very hard time amassing steel and iron because I zoomed out, oh, this is really tiny, so we're going to start playing Fortress, Dwarf Fortress mode, and all that. Now, if you've turned off, um, if you've turned off aquifers, your life is going to be much easier finding an area. It really will be, and here's an evil area and all that. There's a fortress, actually, already in this one, and I don't quite know who... Orzermato, I don't know who that belongs to, but they live in a very hellish landscape. Not fun but it's what they wanted. Now, just looking for an area, clay is good if you want to go into pottery. It's, it really is. Deep soil just depends on what you want, but flunk stone, deep and shallow metals is what you're going to want to look for. Your surroundings, your choice, trees and vegetation, more the better, but it's not necessary. Like, even in, there's some places where it's just scarce, but you might find a lot of good metals there. It just depends on what you want to do. Now, I'm going to leave this video off saying I hope everyone can find a good place to start. And if you have trouble, turn off aquifers. If you're really new to the game, turn them off. They can just be an unnecessary nuisance to you when you're starting. So, I'm just going to leave it off on that. I hope everyone has a good time playing the game, and I hope in some way, shape, or form this little tutorial video has helped you get into it. And I will see everybody when the Let's Play starts. Goodbye, everybody. 
Now, before I leave off, I want to just say one thing. I found a nice area. This is a good thing that you can kind of compare yours to. This is just what I like. I don't like much soil, but I like metals and flux. If you have any questions or anything you want me to explain, just leave it in the comments at the bottom, and I'll get to it when I see it. I like to respond to stuff, and if you've ever left a comment on any of my videos, you know I'm very good about that. Goodbye, everybody.